This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 447, recorded on June 22nd, 2017. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello. And you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here in a lovely New York City day. Let's see what the temperature is before I bring this gentleman onto our airwaves. It's cloudy, partly cloudy, 31 Celsius. 31 Celsius, quite warm. Dixon de Pommier, welcome. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, are there clouds in the sky? Because there my are. weather thing says there are There clouds. are puffy, puffy clouds in the sky. Nice day, 31 Celsius. It's quite lovely out there. Though. What is the humidity? That's the important part. Humidity, it's probably about 40%. F- I was going to say it's low because it feels great. 40%. Also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Hey, Kathy. It's partly cloudy, 86 degrees. Pretty nice. Usually I say southeastern Michigan. I don't know why I said Ann Arbor. Actually, I do know why. I just did a twin with Michelle Swanson, and I use (laughs) Ann Arbor for her. Uh She doesn't like southeastern Michigan. Oh. She said, why why are you saying southeastern Michigan? I'm in Ann Arbor. Okay. Some people you just- either one. Some people you don't mess with. How about just north of South Bend, Indiana? (laughs) (laughs) Not even. (laughs) Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. Alan. It's um it is gorgeous here. It's eighty three Fahrenheit, yeah. twenty eight C. Humidity is only thirty four percent. So oh, no I would kidding. I would say it's a dry heat, but it's not even especially hot. <laughs> it's very, it's very it's gonna be great weather. sleeping weather tonight, I think. Uh, it's always good sleeping weather. <laughs> also joining us from somewhere in Oregon, Rich Condit. Hi everybody, how you doing? Hey Rich. South Bend, that's, is that right? That's, 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 somewhere, that's somewhere is uh, Sun River. Sun River. Which is which is a resort community just 20 minutes uh, south of Bend, uh, as uh, Dixon yeah. says, on the Deschutes River. That's a great place. And, uh, a place. Uh, good for fishing? Uh, here we have, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it's good for fishing, even though I don't do that. People do. Oregon's great fishing country. It is. You don't fish, so, Rich, no? No, I did when I was growing up, um, and I kind of... I did a lot of fly fishing, actually, Dixon, when yeah. I grew up. Oh, nice. In uh, California, Oregon, Washington, British Columbia. Got it. But, um, I, you know. Just burned uh, out? It was, <laughs> now my father motivated it, and I didn't I have sufficient motivation to carry it on myself. So he taught you how to cast? Oh, the whole nine. Wow. I tied, I'm going to do I that tied, in Hamilton. No, no, no. no. Not I, tied, I tied flies. Oh, well. Wow, Rich. That's, yeah. I'm impressed. Do you have any left? <clears throat> yeah, they're collector's uh, no. items, I bet. So wait a minute, you got to hear this. Okay. It's 72 degrees and beautiful sunshine. Yes. 20% humidity. Oh my. Wow. Okay. Wow. That's 22 22 Celsius. It is absolutely gorgeous. Ah. It's going to go up, it's going to get hotter later in the week. It's actually going to get up according to this up to uh, 96, but it'll be low humidity. Oof. This is a high desert. That's right. The west. By is contrast nice. in my now home, yeah, Austin, Texas. Yeah, it is ninety four. Oof. And um, would you rather be uh, there? Forty two percent humidity. I would rather be wherever I am. That's right. Good attitude. I'd rather be you know, wherever, you go, <laughs> wherever you go. There you are. I'd rather be wherever you go. There you are. I like that. I'd rather be. Just rather be. I would like to tell you about the Journal of Microbiology and Biology Education. They are now accepting submissions for a science communication-themed issue. I think we should just submit the the whole TWIV catalog. What do you think? There you go. Sure. (laughs) It's going to explore evaluation and impact of various forms of science communication, understanding cognitive biases related to scientific topics, Mm -hmm. encouraging engagement in science-based dialogues, and more. The deadline to submit, you can, you know, submit an article for this based on those themes. August 7th, go to uh, asmscience.org slash jmbe. You can learn more about what they want. You can meet the guest editor team for this special issue. Mm-hmm. I have some follow-up. First one is from Kathy Spindler. Who? 
<laughs> um, I don't have my document resist. open yet. You better just you want me read to it. read your back. Yeah. Your, Kathy writes another paper demonstrating that having females as role models can aid in retention is this one uh, from 2017. It's called it's in PNAS female peer mentors early in college, increase women's positive academic experiences and retention in engineering. And this is, um, yeah, so this is about engineering. And it's, of course, valid in all fields, Absolutely. right? And uh, Kathy also writes, I forgot to mention that you can apply for an extension to the 10-year span that defines when you are an NIH early-stage investigator. The woman who told me about her experience, she still has no R1 and has new investigator status, but not ESI, did apply for an extension because she had two maternity leaves in the 10 years following when she got her PhD. Mm -hmm. NIH gave her a six-month extension on the 10 years. Blah. It's ridiculous. Uh, Six months. Where do they get these numbers from? Yeah. Don't ask me. It's like half half of, not even, uh, forget they it. pull them out of. <laughs> yes. Yeah. South Bend. South, South Bend. <laughs> exactly. Not Bend. That's where they this get is the South Bend. That's right. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, they bend the numbers. Sometimes you wonder. I also wanted to mention in this line, wonderful article, which I think we mentioned um, last time by Arturo Casadeval published in MBio, Achieving Speaker Gender Equity at the American Society for Microbiology General Meeting. Mm. And they say they achieved gender equity um, in 2015, 48.5% of the oral presentations given by women. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's not equity over the entire life of the meeting, right? Right. Because it would well, take a long time to get to that point. That's going to take centuries if not millennia but it didn't, didn't have, have quite a few years of all female meetings too right. <laughs> but, but if i remember correctly in ann palmenberg's and rob Kalida's article she had said it would take another 10 years for asv to reach equity i didn't understand why because we were at 50 percent already you know yeah. so maybe she was talking about over the life of the conference it's not that long for asv, ASV yeah i sure. my impression was she wasn't uh we're not we have been at 50%, but that's not a regular thing. I think she was, she had graphs and she was talking about the trend lines on the yeah, graphs yeah. and when they will actually cross. Anyway, ASM, uh, this article about ASM, the mechanisms associated were one, making the program committee aware of gender statistics, two, increasing female representation among session convener teams, and three, direct instruction to avoid all male sessions. That means. Don't have all men on your program. <laughs> and But the first one, just saying, hey, we have a problem, Houston. Let's fix it. So, so in other words, make a spreadsheet. Make a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. Wink writes, I'm glad you mentioned that most deaths were due to bacterial pneumonia in 1918-9. Maybe we should be asking what was special about Staph aureus at that time. <clears throat> Wink Weinberger's are... MD friend in uh, Atlanta. Was he winking when he said that? Because I thought bacterial pneumonia was caused by pneumococcus. Pneumonia. Yeah, I thought so too. Not Staph aureus, right? Oh, that's right. Um, anyway, I don't know if we could know what was different about pneumococcus, but we didn't have antibiotics, and that probably... <laughs> that's the only thing you have to say. <laughs> and it's a... It's history. You no, know, it's known to be a secondary effect of influenza infection. Sure. So if you don't have antibiotics, it can be a real problem. Yeah, yeah. Kathy, are you ready? I am ready. Casey writes, hello, I'm a relatively recent regular listener, mostly because I never used to listen to podcasts in general very regularly. And I was listening to the latest episode, TWIV 446, where you discuss the gender parity trends at virology conferences. I thought it might have inspired you to look back at TWIV guests and authors of papers discussed on the podcast to see what the gender parity trends on TWIV have been. But since I didn't hear you mention them, I'm assuming you don't have a similar spreadsheet of your own. I think it would be interesting if someone could compile that data, although I'm not volunteering. <laughs> as far as gender parity of hosts, it's not so great, which had occurred to me before while listening. I tried to reason that the sample size is small. And the way hosts were picked was probably based on previous personal relationships and not simply looking for talented virology professionals. But it would make me more comfortable if Kathy wasn't the only female host. I'm wondering if Kathy has any thoughts on the subject. Casey. P.S. It's currently 29 degrees C here in Georgia with a high for the day of 32 degrees C. P.P.S. Vincent, I thought you'd like to know that you inspired me to change the units of my weather app to degrees C so I could become more familiar with the Celsius scale. Someone who 
who supports Celsius? <laughs> Casey. So Vincent has uh, microbe TV hosts overall, 11 male, 3 female, but it's changing this year. Guests on TWIV, 165 male, 64 female. Should we add a sixth host? So, or get uh, rid of a fifth host. Yeah, we'll get rid of you, Dixon. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I have had some thoughts about this, and it would be nice you know, to have another woman on the podcast, but sometimes it gets unwieldy when there's five of us plus a guest or a guest or two. <laughs> and um, so, uh, in fact, the first time I came on permanently, I had said to Vincent ahead of time, you know, if there's a week when you've got a lot of people and, you know, you don't know, need me, that's okay. And so that very week, there were all five of us plus two guests. So my first permanent twiv, there were seven of us. <laughs> so it, that can a be lot, yeah. a lot of people to talk. So, you know, maybe we could do some more with female guest co-hosts, you know, when we know ahead of time that somebody's going to be missing or that we're going to have lower numbers of us on. And then we'll just see what happens over time. Yeah. I, I So uh, this, this idea of the host being picked based on previous personal relationships, this would imply that I only know men. <laughs> and I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like that. Um, not simply looking for talented virology. Yeah, that, that wasn't. I mean, I picked Dixon because he was here. And yeah, then... Uh, um, after a few after a month, I realized he wasn't going to be reliable. <laughs> be nice to Dixon. Well, he Very was going nice. to go away. Wait, what happened sure. when you went to India for a month? What was I going to do? I so I said I got to get someone. And the first person that came to mind was Alan because I said, "Well, right. it'd be nice to have a writer on the show." And uh, so it was Alan. And then um, we then Alan and I actually did a bunch of shows just together, <laughs> the yep. two of us. And then we had Rich on because as a pox virus person and. He got it, so I said, "Yeah, let's get him on," and um, you know, then Kathy. So uh, I, I would like. So we're going to do some new podcasts. I hope, which will have a very different balance. And um, but it, it doesn't fix Twiv, which is the most listened to, of course. Mm. So I think we should just have try to have more female hosts, uh, co host or guests. Yes, and maybe yes, especially when people yeah. when, when we do have a schedule, so we know ahead of time when people aren't going to be here. Um, we could try and line up uh, another female host. You know, surprisingly, it's not easy to get people. <laughs> so, <laughs> to, uh, to set aside two hours one day yeah, a week, every, not, I mean, every single week, yeah. It's not trivial. And especially if you say, come on, we're going to do a paper, not your work. They have to read the paper and so Gotta forth. Got to spend another another hour or two reading yeah, and yeah. figuring out the paper. and what so you, yeah. It's not trivial, and people have said I no. Sp yeah. I, spend, uh, I spend more than that. I spend, you know... Uh, at least four or five hours a week doing this, and that's a, you know, it's a standing commitment. Oh. I've noticed the I've noticed the thing about uh, gender uh, representation on Twiv, and you know, it's kind of it's uh, it evolves the way Vincent said it evolved, and um, and here we are. I think uh, uh, it would be nice, uh, but uh, we're here. It's uh, better than. Uh, I'm, I'm glad Kathy's here and I think having, adding more, it's, there's, there's too, too many hosts already. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, and, <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute, Dixon. You're one. I resemble that remark. I mean, I was about to, you know, <laughs> uh, I could, I could volunteer to bail out, you know? <clears throat> well, so yeah, you really um, want to do that, dude? No, don't want no, to no. stay rich. I mean, I like Twiv. I wouldn't let uh, you go anyway. Would and you. Twiv likes you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this is this is also the way we end up with all male panels at meetings. You know, the the meeting organizers right. typically don't start out to say, "Hey, let's have an all male panel." Right. They just say, "Who's who's easy to find and and uh, who we know in this field," and they pick some people, and then you have a whole bunch of people sitting on stage who all look identical and. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, with Twiv, it kind of evolved, as Vincent explained, and um, you know, most the most recent two hosts were added by covering their papers, and just, that that was the rep representation we ended up with. Um, but if we if we went to something like a rotating host schedule, I'd be okay with that. I, I don't think I'd want to step out entirely, but if you want to 
do it so that different hosts rotate in and out different weeks. That might be an option. Oh, yeah, I'll, ro- I'll rotate out. <laughs> right. We would never uh, even get connected by so. Skype. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the podcast would, would be, be a, no, it would be a conference call by telephone. <laughs> Four people trying to figure out Skype. Yeah. No. Um, you know, the I other thing is that as this evolved, you never imagined, I don't think, that we were going to be doing this seven years later. That's true. Right. With, I, uh, I, I with, sure didn't. With a minimum of 10,000 yeah. uh, listeners. It was just, we we're just, you know, trying it out, right? That's right. That's yeah. right. Well, I, there was a point where uh, I mean, we were popular, and I think that's when Kathy came on, really. Yeah. yeah. And we said we got to have some female yeah. representation. Absolutely. But um, I agree that we're 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 unbalanced, and I'm very much aware of it. I think we all are. And um, but something we can definitely do is in terms of guests. Yeah. I think I think that's a balance that should be fairly easy to, or relatively easy to. Um, to help yeah, I guess they're easy. But, you know, looking at the TWIV uh, schedule here, where is it? TWIV schedule. We do keep a, a Google Doc. Till the end of this year, we have a schedule. So let's see. So Kathy is going to be away in August and September. Um, and the rest of the year, there's nobody missing. Of course, nobody's filled in anything yet. Are you going right. to be missing? <laughs> I will be missing in action for some part of those months, too. If you let us know ahead of time, I could get other okay. people. Right. Can I get a female Dixon de Pommier? Uh, Someone who I have to uh, be nice to? <laughs> I think you have to be nice to everybody, first of all. So that I am. Uh, well, I didn't say you weren't. I just said Sorry. continue to be yeah. nice. How's uh, that? Yeah. Um, but let us know ahead of time. F- folks, this is a good time for you to go to the schedule and fill out your schedule. Yeah, that's right. And um, yeah, I, I'm not filled in after... October 22nd. And I will try. And let me just say, if there are f- female virologists out there that's who the way to uh, put it. That's don't the way mind to put it. putting in a couple hours a week sure. for science communication, and you have to have a great radio voice, of course, like all of us. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not a requirement. But if you'd like to join us now and then, you can let us know. Yeah, and you don't have to make it an every week commitment, no. but if you, uh, if you could do this once a month or twice a month or something, um, step in and uh, one of us can step out. That'd be fine. All right, um, Dixon, can you take that last follow-up? I will please? try. <clears throat> Jens writes, "Thanks, guys, hmm, for reading our very lengthy explanatory letter about PPNS RV dash one on TWIV four three three four four three. I see. I can't read this one. You want to uh, skip it, it? No, no, it's fine." It was indeed all in good fun, and as you pointed out, the best part about TWIV is that things can be discussed at length and multiple times in a civil manner, much in opposition to peer review, (laughs) which is often ridiculously hostile. I learn new things from you every week, and I'm very happy that every now and then I can contribute something that you don't know. Mm -hmm. Best, Jens. Well, that's our philosophy here on TWIV. It is. Civil discourse. Did, did we determine that when I adjust the font size, Dixon doesn't see it? Yeah, he doesn't. His screen. His, his iPad I'm doesn't refresh. No, I, actually, uh-huh. I'm good. I'm good. You're good? Okay. I'm good. I just stumbled over PPNSRV-1. That doesn't roll I think off everybody the does. My time. <laughs> 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 All right. Also, for those of you who enjoyed our pipette washer discussion, Kathy has made a, a, a video of a pipette washer in action, <laughs> yes. which, is, which is not... The most scintillating thing, watching water rise and fall. What is oh, it like? Oh, it's so cool. It's, it's very cool. It is. It's it very is cool. mesmer- I, I remember this thing <laughs> when I was in the lab. The, uh, yeah, yeah, the yeah. dishwasher would come in and she would set it up and it would That's just right. sit there on the sink for for a while, filling in quietly, emptying itself. Exactly. Well, Double. so it's my lab dishwasher that you see briefly featured in it. <laughs> and, you know, I left a note on the pipette washer and said, Alice, when you're going to do this next, I need to make a video of this. And so I was explaining to her why. And she goes, oh, yeah, it's so cool to watch. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know. So you got three minutes of water <laughs> rising and falling. So and that's, I have, and that's I have two, spent cycles. Many, yep. two cycles. I have spent many hours sitting, watch, standing, watching the pipette <clears> washer. I've got the sound muted on this. I sh- assume you've got the nice gurgle when it 
gets yeah. down to the bottom. Yeah, and you there's can, a little you bit can of put narration. put this on a loop and it'll get a billion hits on YouTube. <laughs> this is true. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. By the yeah, way, we're having trouble stuff. sleeping. We'll see. We'll put it <laughs> there's, a, there's a similar, um, I, I didn't mention it in that discussion, but there's a similar device that was used in dark rooms. Um, yes. My dad had one yeah, that, yeah, on his true. on his print washer in the home dark true. room. This is true. Um, you could set it. He had it just to like a plastic storage tray with this thing, uh, yeah. the siphon, the double siphon hanging on the side, and it would fill and empty itself just indefinitely. Yeah. All right, we we are doing an old email episode today. We are, but don't leave. So those no. of you who hate those can go ahead and uh, <laughs> click away now. We might geek out on other topics. Yes. This first one I want we awesome. read on Twip the other day, and I and this the PS part I wanted to read here. It's from John in Limerick. He writes, I was listening to the team on Twiv discussing a paper a few episodes ago, and Vincent mentioned that two of the authors had Ascaris. My first thought that flashed into my head was that's an odd thing to say, but Albendazole or Ivermectin <laughs> should clear it up. Right. Of course, what Vincent <laughs> actually said was that the authors had asterisks. They were joint first authors. I've been infected by TWIP. <laughs> great. That's great. I loved it. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> it was yeah. terrific. Yes. Absolutely terrific. <laughs> Couldn't just keep that on TWIP, right, Dixon? No, no. You had to share that with the world. Alan, can you take the next one? Sure. Sean writes, hello, Dr. Reckonello. I'm a recent fan of the TWIV podcast. I especially appreciated your last cast, number 438, Doctors TWIV Go to Washington. I'm a BS-level biologist who chose industry over further academics, mostly because I was a former U.S. Army medic nurse, 12 years, who fell in love with pathophysiology and went back to school to study biology and got a late start on my undergraduate career. Mm. Since then, I've been working in the marketing and sales of molecular diagnostics and life science reagents. Please forgive the backstory, but getting back to my appreciation of cast number 438, what really resonated for me is the conversation regarding scientific communication, specifically the communication to both professionals and lay people alike. Additionally, the topic of how the Internet has changed communication both for better and worse. As a life science marketer, I am constantly thinking about these topics and looking for new ways to illustrate the scientific utility of our innovative products and services across multiple generations of scientists who consume scientific communication differently. It was a good podcast to listen to during my 1.5-hour commute, and thank you for representing (laughs) the science at the march. I'm sorry you have a 1.5-hour commute. That sounds horrible. Indeed. Um, I guess it depends on the commute, though. I currently work for Promega Corporation. I'm not sure how familiar you are with our unique organization. little aside, I'm quite familiar with Promega. We used to use their stuff all the time in the lab. Uh, We are one of the last privately held global life science companies. We have offices or branches in 16 countries, and we're truly unique because we're privately owned and empowered by our founder and still CEO chairman to be primarily scientifically focused. It sends a good uh, an article if you're interested in learning more about our founder, CEO, Chairman Bill Linton, uh, an article called Capitalist with a Soul. <laughs> our commercial efforts are more tailored to support the scientific discussion rather than bang customers over the head with our products and services. I noticed in listening to your podcast that you have sponsors. Again, this goes back to something that is in line with our commercial ethos, support the scientific discussion. Do you have a sponsorship information packet you could send me? <laughs> As I'm sure you're aware, ASV is being held in Madison, Wisconsin in a few months. Uh, Actually, a few days. Madison is the world headquarters for Promega Corporation, and if you happen to be attending and broadcasting TWIV from ASV this year, I'm wondering if we could be a sponsor. See, this is what happens when we don't get around to reading our email for a while. I'll be darned. Additionally, we have quite a few technologies that are unique to support virologists, everything from simple benchtop automation to purify viral DNA. Everything from simple (laughs) benchtop automation to purifying viral nucleic acids to viral tagging using our proprietary luciferase technologies for a variety of real-time imaging of infection or transmission. Our R&D scientists might be good panel members for on a future episode. Every week we have an R&D meeting where all of the company comes together to discuss a scientific topic for a few hours. Sometimes we bring an outside speaker. Sometimes it's a mixed speaker presentation and open discussion forum. From my perspective, it would be very, it would be really cool if you'd be open to discussing the possibility of broadcasting from the Promega campus. Let me know if you'd like to further investigate this idea. It could, it could have nothing to do with Promega. In fact, last month we hosted a Zika discussion group, David O'Connor et al. We love the opportunity to be supporting scientific discourse. Apologies for being long-winded. I'm a fan. Please send me sponsorship. 
if I'm being long-winded, I'm a fan. Okay, thank you, Sean. Uh, but, uh, uh, um, oh, good job. Good <laughs> two, job, Two, three, Sean. four. Please send me sponsorship information and consider us for ASV. And Sean is global marketing manager for ProMega. Um, yeah, probably too late for this no, no, year. No, I, I contacted him right away. You did? Okay. <laughs> yeah, he's, ProMega is sponsoring. They, uh, are. they are the sole sponsor of TWIV at ASV this year. And, awesome. Uh, are helping us pay for everyone's travel for sure. That's yeah. very nice. All right, who's next? Rich Condit is next. Anthony writes, Twix listening post. <laughs> Here's my new computer setup for Microbe TV, and he's attached a picture of um, Your- a screen with a nice picture of Vincent on it in front of the wall with a bottle of Gila's and a bunch of wires in a box below the screen and a keyboard. There's another picture down here that has a cat sitting under the screen. <laughs> exactly. He says the system is a Raspberry Pi PI, that little box under the screen, as suggested a month or so ago by Alan Dove. The display was a gift, but I had to pay for the computer myself. <laughs> Price of the computer, around 60 bucks. Oh, my the man. screen, maybe 700 bucks. What's the information <laughs> worth? Priceless. <laughs> the cat's name is Cy. That's great. Right. Yeah. Cool. A lot of wires. That's his CAT scan device. A lot of wires. I notice he's got some science books there on the second picture. I see mobile DNA. Look at that. And I see genetic and chemical and infect. Uh, 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 wow. Uh, uh, cool. Uh, I don't think a, a monitor is 700 bucks anymore, though. He got a pretty nice looking one. That's pretty a big. pretty good size monitor. It is. Yeah, it's I probably high def. I just put, see this thing here, Dixon? I do. This is uh, pretty big. It's 120 big. bucks. No, no, listen, pretty soon they'll be giving them away because they have replaceable parts or something. Like, uh, you know, cameras that used to be like that with film. They they used to almost give you the camera so that you could keep buying their film. But nowadays you buy a printer because <laughs> they want you to pay for the cartridges, right? <laughs> that's exactly. Right. That's right. Exactly right. Well, cool. That's nice, Anthony. And um, uh, so you could, you, you talked about this, Alan, but this little pie will... It's a computer. Be a computer, it's right? A, it's a fully functional Linux computer, and you can run it as a desktop. My daughter has one in her room as her Neat. desktop computer. Um, runs a browser. Runs, um, you know, it'll it'll do all the basic desktop computer stuff. If you try and do something really intensive on it, you know, editing animation videos or something, then it's gonna <laughs> have, it's gonna yeah. bog down because it's a very a tiny little processor. But you see the the little clear box next to the next to Psy in the picture. Yep. Um, that's the whole computer. Can you hook them up in tandem and get double the cost? Or uh, Psy on the computer, probably not. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. that's not exactly right. Uh, you can no. You can, <laughs> people have people have done a um, an array of Raspberry Pi computers, which is yeah. not as practical as just buying a regular computer, but it can be useful if you want to learn about that kind of networking architecture for multi-core computers. Got it. Hmm. Interesting. Yes. Very interesting. Very yeah. much so. The fact that you can display microbe TV is all you need, actually. It's the only website yes. you need. To <laughs> That's go. the only website you need. <laughs> Christopher writes, hey, Twivsters, I have a bit of follow-up for the episode with Tim. I read Tim's article and I listened to your interview. I found the article's tone even and measured. And I had very little to disagree with. However, when he spoke on TWIV, I noticed more frustration and cynicism. Rather than quibble about arguments and assertions, I'd like to make a statement. Scientists explaining science is important, but it's not enough. The good thing is you are not alone. Science helps us shape the understanding of our objective reality, but it is up to all of us, to the scientists, to the science communicators, to the teachers, to the tinkerers, to the enthusiasts, to the chronically curious <laughs> to help shape the opinions and beliefs of the public and those surrounding us. Plant the seed of curiosity in our children. Show people our perspectives are limited, but that's okay. Help people understand why we need science through impassioned, lively discussions. Optimism is desperately needed in our political climate. Be the ones to provide it. We don't have one solution to affect change. We have many, and we need them all. We need to get there first. We need to be persuasive. We need to have optimism. We need to spark curiosity. There's more to know out there. The next step in technological advancement, the next treatment for a debilitating illness, the solution for the crying child in the third world country who isn't getting enough food. It is out there, and the scientific process can and will help us find it. Mm -hmm. 
In the words of Carl Sagan, somewhere something incredible is waiting to be known. That's great. Scientists explaining science is not enough, but you're not alone. Yes, I don't know who you think was frustrated and cynical, us or Tim. <laughs> it's not clear from this. However, um, see, see, Tim, not Tim, uh, <clears throat> Christopher, my shtick, and probably others here, is we want scientists to communicate more because they don't communicate enough. I don't say it's the only way to communicate science. I never have said that. But my goal in life is to encourage scientists to communicate. And I know other people do it and we need it all. So I'm not saying we don't need them, but I'm focusing on one thing that is not done frequently enough. So, but I, everything you say, I agree with. So there. Yes. I'm really happy to have the opportunity to do some of this with uh, TWIV because every time I think about science communication, that kind of stuff, I think, yeah, I agree. We all ought to do it. And that's great. But how, you know, what's your, what's your, what's the mechanism? Where do you do it? Yeah. Do you, you know, uh, open up a shop somewhere and invite people in? I don't know. Yeah, it's a I'm good happy idea. To, you could serve I'm, them uh, coffee and cookies and well, talk about science. That would be great. Actually, there is this uh, thing called Science Cafe. Yeah, yeah. That happens in, I think it's a nationally organized uh, thing. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, um, I've done where they do here. just that. Yeah. So I've done one. At any rate, here. yep. Well, I'm I happy think it was. Opportunity. I, I'm not sure if this is a legitimate quote, but it's supposedly Teddy Roosevelt said, "Do what you can with what you have where you are." Really, mm -hmm. that's good. Yes. Mm -hmm. Kathy, you're next. Okay, Daniel writes, greetings from Norway. Have you ever been here? Here up in the freezing north, we have no viruses, but I still think you would find something to do here. Of course. I listen people. to your... <laughs> of course, viruses they have viruses. are everywhere. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, I listen to your podcast as much as I can. I really do find the bunch of you funny and engaging. I'm studying biology at the University of Oslo, and I want to work in virology or entomology or something. <laughs> I also want to win your book. Much love, Daniel. Sounds like if Daniel doesn't think there are viruses up there, he's going to have to move. <laughs> <laughs> P.S. I lost the book competition. I retract everything I wrote. <laughs> no, if nice. if I nice. lost the book competition. Oh, if I lost. Yeah, he didn't sorry. lose it yet, but he's working on it. <laughs> Do we still have a book competition going? Uh, no, no. There's, uh, I wanted uh, to wait a while. I have some more books to give away, but we'll right. resume after. So, Daniel, you lost the book competition. Sorry, That's Daniel. right, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever been? You've been to Norway, Dixon, right? Brief. I, I brief. Norway. No, I've been to Finland. That's I've it. Landed in Norway, and then I took off and went to Sweden. You take the next one, uh, Robert. Uh, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What? I got something to say about. Go ahead. That, right? <laughs> Go ahead. Because I have not been to Norway. I have been to Finland. We're in Finland. Hmm. I forget. Helsinki. But I spent a summer in Sweden. Did mm -hmm. you? I was, an ex I was an exchange student. Nice. With the American Field Service. Uh, in what must have been about 1964, 65. Right. Uh, and I'm just looking at the latitudes here because uh, Oslo is pretty far north, but I was in a place called Robertsfors, which is just uh, south of the Arctic Circle. And we had, I'm, <laughs> I was only there during the summer. Winter would have been really strange. Yeah. But uh, we had, you know, the sun went down to the horizon. You had long and days. had a nice sort of sunset at about oh, 11.30 p.m. Right. And then <laughs> came back up about 1 o'clock, and that was it. <laughs> it was great. So there you go. There you go, Dix. Okay. Robert writes, hi, Twiv. I would like to be able to play Twiv through my Alexa. Is there any way currently? If not, check out the link about developing such a skill. It appears fairly straightforward as long as the RSS feed audio fits the Amazon format. Plus, it is free to develop and publish Echo Skills. Thanks, Rob. All right. Well, we had this request for other podcasts, and I did make the RSS feed supposedly Alexa compatible, but it still doesn't work, and our... Podcast guru Ray Ortega is aware of this, and he's working on it. Hmm. All, all you have to do is shout, Alexa, make my podcast play. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, apparently it doesn't work. Uh, yeah. Alan, do you know what an Alexa is? Not Alan, Dixon. Dixon. Oh, I, know I know what you an know. Alexa is. You do? Yeah. What is what, it? It's, it's a car. Jeopardy. 
<laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, fine. Very good. Alan, can you take the next one? Sure. Chris writes, greetings, TWIF professors. We've been having our usual mercurial spring weather in central Ohio. It has been anywhere between freezing and 30 degrees C, but without too much severe weather. I thought to write this email after listening to a recent episode and noticing yet again that the theme music has changed. I've got two things I want to discuss, so I'll go in increasing order. First, I like the musical content of the new intro music better than the old music, and it's finally stopped being a bit jarring to hear it at the start of the episodes because I'm still expecting the old intro. (laughs) On this most recent episode, I mentally reminded myself that the new intro music was just about to play and I was not startled by the different music. Hopefully, after a few more episodes, I'll finally stop having to be conscious that I should expect the new music and the new music will simply become the normal TWIV music. Okay. Second, I'm about two-thirds of the way through reading Paul de Croix's Microbe Hunters. I'm currently in the middle of the chapter on Theobald Smith. Ah, nice. And I'm finding it quite enjoyable. De Croix is very good at emphasizing the individual personalities of the scientists he covers and how their collaborations and grudges shaped the root of microbe hunting. The other thing that stuck with me is um, that most of the scientists he covered in the book were either still alive or had only passed away within the past 40 years before the book was published. Do you all have any book recommendations for a similar but more modern book that would cover more recent scientists? As much as I've enjoyed reading this book while waiting for the computers to behave at work, I cannot recommend this book without the major asterisk, that's asterisk, not asterisk, (laughs) that it contains liberal use of what may most politely or euphemistically be described as 1926 aphorisms, and those may be a strong turnoff to a potential reader. On a more positive note regarding the language de Croix uses, the older spelling and grammar the book uses occasionally awakens some linguistic interest, like mm-hmm. how they hyphenated freelance, which highlights the mercenary nature of freelance work much better than the unhyphenated version of the word does. <laughs> <laughs> I would recommend Time, Love, and Memory by Jonathan Weiner, which I just finished. It is. Uh, it starts around the turn of the century with... Um, our Drosophila guy here at Columbia. Dobchinsky? No, no. The other one. The, the modern Drosophila guy. He had the, the fly. Uh, which century? 20th century. Modern? 20th okay. century. Come on. The guy at Columbia who had the fly lab. You and I, Dixon, should have this on the tip of our tongues. I, since I just read the bloody book. And I should. Morgan. Thomas Hunt Morgan. Yeah, Thomas Morgan. Dobchinsky worked with him. Later? Yeah. All right. But anyway, Thomas Hunt Morgan, it goes through uh, Seymour Benzer. Sturt event. Uh, Morgan. Sturt event. That's right. It goes to, um, sure. you know, Jim Watson. It goes to, yeah. uh, I'm looking at, thinking for this. I can't think. Anyway, come, it brings uh, genetics through the revolution to the present. Mm-hmm. Really good. And, mm-hmm. and Wiener is a, a wonderful mm-hmm. author. So I would recommend that. And then as, as Alan was reading, I thought of Natural Obsessions about the Weinberg Lab, although not too many scientists that you would know maybe in that except for Weinberg. Mm. But I time love memory for sure. Read it. Yeah. Does anyone know anything else that would be good? No. No. Rich Conde, you must have something to say. Crickets. No, I got nothing uh, on this one. No one has <clears throat> written uh, a, a, a retrospective study of the discovery of DNA as the genetic material and what's happened since then. Yeah, double helix. Because that's, yeah, well, that's the book about just those two people. But, <laughs> no, yeah. uh, but you should read it. It's really good. <laughs> but a lot of stuff has happened since then, obviously. So I, I'm surprised that there's no summary book on that topic yet. And maybe it, it's Dixon. a great. Why don't you write it? Because I don't know that literature at all. We'll learn it. Uh, I could, but I. I'm, I know you have other things to do. Uh, well, it's not I about, just. I don't think I would there be very a, good at that. Uh, actually, now that I'm thinking of it, oh man, uh, I gotta, uh, I gotta leave and go look this book up because. Okay, are you you going away? Because you have to read the next email. <laughs> we, no, I can tell you a little about uh, DeCroix and the connection to the University of Michigan. Oh. Remember when we were talking about yep. Novi and the rat virus? Yep. Mm. Uh, DeCroix is one of the authors on that paper. Mm. which is listed, uh, he was born in Zeeland, Michigan, uh, died in Holland, Michigan, and he graduated from the University of Michigan in 1912, got his PhD here in 1916. Goodness. So, when you mentioned the um, the microbe hunters that clicked all of that together, he assisted Sinclair Lewis with oh. uh, Sinclair Lewis's Pulitzer Prize winning novel, Aerosmith. Mm. So, I remembered that connection, but had to refresh my memory about 
to Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm back. All right. The um, book is the book is uh, it wasn't a big seller, uh, and it must be. Hmm. Huh, that's a long years, title. 30, 30 <laughs> years <laughs> must be thirty years old by now. It's called Invisible Frontiers by Stephen Hall, oh. uh, and it's uh, about. Uh, the uh, discovery of cloning. Basically, it was the uh, the the race among three different laboratories to be the first to clone and express uh, the gene for insulin, human insulin. And that's pretty good. Oh, nice. So Jonathan Beckwith is credited as isolating the first gene ever. Is that correct? Really? Yeah, he isolated uh, a gene from E. coli, as I recall. To pull the book off my shelf. I think it's actually Dixon's. Is it? It's on your level. It is? I mean, it's called. Cool. You, you have all your extra stuff in my office. I do. I do. Well, you've does it have me. large illustrations? And- oh, stop it. <laughs> it's The Eighth Day of Creation <laughs> by, right. by no, uh, Horace not, Freeland Judson. That's not my book. It is. The, Re- the Makers of the Revolution in Biology. Does anyone know this one? I don't. I've it, heard of it. It's an eloquent, profound, entertaining, and witty book. Oh. First h- historical account of the central line of discoveries of molecular biology. Could be good. It it, could yeah, be it's yours. Good. It's not mine. I'll be darned. Well, maybe it is. I'll take it. <laughs> Fine. I hereby give it to you. <laughs> but I'm not carrying it with me. It's too heavy. Right. All right, Rich, take the next one, please. Valerie writes, hi, guys, uh, and Kathy. Uh, first <laughs> of all, thanks for the great podcast. Not just fascinating and informative, but also highly entertaining. Mm. Listening to some of the recent TWIF material got me very interested in marine viruses and the vast range of hosts they infect, as well as their role in nutrient cycling. Mm -hmm. So I wondered if you could perhaps expand a little on this topic in one of the upcoming episodes. I'd absolutely love to hear more about the current hot topics and challenges in marine virology. Also, I should add that I am what in the UK is called a mature student. I'm 29 and have just started my biosciences degree after years of independent study. And podcasts like TWIV are fantastic for expanding my horizons and providing a little direction for my future academic career. Though I must say, I've always gravitated, uh, always gravitated towards virology anyway. Mm-hmm. All the best, Valerie. P.S. I'd love to hear, I'd love, I'd tell you about the weather in England but it's just too depressing. <laughs> Good. Well, uh, we did have Curtis Suttle on, so you should check out that episode. Mm. And um, I suspect that um, we'll have some more. And we had Forrest Rower some time ago. Forrest Rower, that's right. Penn State. Hmm. What about Shapiro and Beckwith? That was the first I clone? F- I found it in a, a timeline. Mm. I was about to insert the... Mm-hmm. That bit of the timeline, but that's that's the main part of it. All right. 1969. There you go. Ben writes, Dear Vincent and the gang of TWIV, thought you'd be pleased to know that I found your TWIV 395 episode, The Cancer Thief, so compelling that I invited your guest, Steve Russell, to Johns Hopkins for a seminar and to meet your with faculty and students. He gave an absolutely inspiring talk at our weekly molecular pathology lecture series. Mm-hmm which I have to say was the best attended session I've ever seen. Prior to hearing the podcast, I knew very little of oncolytic viral therapy and likely would not have crossed path with Steve otherwise. So we at Hopkins owe you all a debt of gratitude for doing what you do, spreading contagious virology. <laughs> Please keep up your excellent work. Ben is a professor of immunopathology at Johns Hopkins. He sent a picture of him with Steve Russell, who was our guest almost a year ago at ASV twenty. 16. Mm-hmm. He looks to have healed in this photograph. Yeah, that's right. He'd fallen off his bike. Eek. Hence yeah. the name of the episode, The Cancer Thief. He had, it is actually probably very close to a year ago because last year's meeting was earlier than this year's. It was uh, in, uh, earlier in June, yeah. Yeah, one week earlier. Uh, yeah, it was that because of AS, as is some other reason, I guess. Yeah. That's just when it was. Yep. Yeah. Um, Kathy, you're next. Brandon writes, Dear TWIV Consortium, please forgive my formatting for I'm not much of a letter writer. Second, my name is Brandon from Denver, Colorado, a longtime listener who has only emailed once. Even that was a half-hearted attempt to win one of your contests. (laughs) As I write, it is 9.30 p.m. and 49 Celsius. I insert (laughs) here. 
he must mean Fahrenheit because 49C is 120F. Pretty up there. And anyway, the whole sentence is, it's 9.30 p.m. and 49 Celsius after a weekend that saw about six inches of snow. Right. So, okay. I write for no particular reason. A large part of it is the admiration I have for you all. Part of it is that I have eked out just enough time to put together an email for you, which is something I've wanted to do for a long time. My favorite episodes are Twiv 373 with Dr. Younger, Younger and Twiv 395, The Cancer Thief. I have listened to those episodes many times over. They have stopped me from remaining current. <laughs> as much <laughs> as I love the usual gang, your interviews with other distinguished virologists tend to be especially riveting. Um, and so when I tripped over the name, it really was Dr. Youngner, Julius Youngner. Okay. Now, a little bit about myself. The least interesting part, I assure you. I am a high school dropout from a family of high school dropouts that eventually realized school is cool. I went back and finished my high school diploma, and I'm now finishing my final semester as an undergrad, earning a degree in biology with a minor in chemistry. I'm proud to say I will be going to the University of Florida to pursue a master's degree in microbiology this upcoming fall. I would like to thank the good doctors of TWIF for keeping me motivated. Through your constant humor, or humor in quotes, from Dixon, stimulating discussions and continued desire to learn. Thank you all for the work that you do, and keep up the excellence in science communication. Tiredly yours, Brandon. He wrote this on May 1st. Even then, I still don't think it could have gotten to 120 Fahrenheit. <laughs> <laughs> P.S. I do find Dixon quite funny and appreciated his attempt at the over 9,000 meme. I often find myself rolling my eyes with a smile on my face after one of his puns. P.P.S. I'm glad Rich is back. Though I may not recognize his face, I would be able to pick out that voice anywhere. <laughs> so, Dixon. Yes. Do you see now the power of podcasting? The power of podcasting. Which you never got. The power of public podcasting. See, this guy likes you. Um, I'm, I'm flattered. I roll my eyes with a smile after one of his puns. And this helped motivate him to I'm finish amazed. college and go on for a master's degree. I think he might have mistaken me for Alan, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Alan has much better puns than oh, I Oh, we did the over 9,000 on TWIP. Uh, we did. So yes, 9, we did. That's definitely you. That's true. Alan. Anthony writes, Dr. Osterholm discuss discussing his new book on Outbreak News Today. Um <laughs> Uh, hmm. This is, yeah, I hadn't seen this. Mike Osterholm, Deadliest Enemy, Our War Against Killer Germs. I'm not buying it. Uh, yeah, that could, that that may just annoy me. Um, I mean, he's, he's a smart guy and very well educated. I'm sure there's a lot of interesting stuff in here. Uh, but Mike Osterholm and Mark Olshaker. So I'm wondering if this is ghost written. Mark. Well, oh, that's the, yeah, I bet it was. I bet it yeah. was. Yeah. Um, and it could be a good book, but I don't, I don't think I'm going to rush out to get it. Uh, I did have to wonder about his description of the pressing concern for bioterrorism enabled through genetic information. Okay, I'm definitely not going to get this book now. Uh, Osterholm's mention of crop dusters might be something not to discount. There were reports of uh, Atta's looking at crop dusters. Atta? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mohammed Atta, the guy who flew the airplane. Nine eleven. Oh, oh, yes. Actually, that that probably would have um, would have saved everybody a lot of trouble. Crop dusters have among the highest fatality rates of any type of airplane. Um, Alan Dove has outlined on Twiv the reasons why bioterrorism is unlikely to become a weapon in the arsenal of terrorists. In terms of attacking human populations, the analysis is certainly valid. I question whether that's true for the sabotage of crops or factory farms. Well. It would be hard to beat what we already do to our crops and factory farms in terms <laughs> of true. infectious disease. Yeah, uh, so it's true. it's going to take a lot to um, to be heard above the background on that. Yeah, which is kind of the story of of biological warfare anyway. Uh, I mean the the one successful true bioterror attack that I can think of was a salmonella outbreak in Oregon, I believe, that was uh, caused by a cult that sprayed, deliberately sprayed um, salmonella on salad bars. And it was investigated and contained as a public health, typical food safety type of outbreak. And um, nobody even knew it was a terrorist attack until years later when some member of the cult quit and, uh, and blabbed about it. Um, so that's, that's bioterrorism for you. Um, Indeed. 
I think the worst terrorist act in the world right now is the pumping of CO2 into the atmosphere through coal that's, powered plants. Yeah, it depends on how you characterize terrorism, but uh, yeah, but you know, compared to compared to the amount of damage you can do with a rider truck full of ammonium nitrate and fuel oil or yeah. or a half dozen people with basic aviation training and box cutters, you know, the, just the the yield on biodefense on bioterror weapons is so incredibly low. I like how Alan summarizes things. Yeah. <laughs> basic aviation training and some box cutters. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Rich Condit, can you take Wait the a next minute, one? I didn't go that last round. Okay. Yeah, you did. Uh-huh. No, I didn't. Yeah, yeah you did. I don't remember. I have a list here. I keep a list and I'm and checking it. I have it the twice. same list. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I forget. <laughs> you remember in the old episodes, I used to say, Who's next? Who's next? I started keeping a list. Oh, right. VKDAR. That's today's. Wait list. a second. Wait a second. Um, Kathy read the one from Brandon with 49 Celsius. Don't do any fact check. No, no, he's right. No, he, Anthony, listen, Anthony, was, Anthony's was letter I read. Yeah. That's right. Dixon should have been I in there. Skipped. No, no, there was there was a little glitch, okay. but it was before that. But <laughs> you want me to, have to put Dixon in? We'll no. we'll do it around. No, I, I'll, I'll I was come. I was after Dixon previously, so <laughs> okay. yeah, but okay. but you can go ahead and Rich, skip down the list. Can you, Rich, uh, Rich. speak? Uh, you want me to read an email now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, fortunately, I don't have a list. So uh, K E D A R Ketter Keter. You guess. Sorry. It is mine. Sorry. Okay. Oh. Sorry. I can't. Sorry. I don't have the pronunciation. I'm going to say Keter. No, I'm going to say Keter. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, hi, Professor Rack and Yellow and team. I've been listening to TWIV for a long time now, and I've always wanted to thank you for all the amazing work that you've all been doing, dissecting science for the curious folk like me. I was a little underconfident to write in, but today I have somehow gathered the courage to tell you that I am extremely grateful for, to the Twim, TWIV team. I've learned a lot. Thank you. Something about myself. I'm a veterinarian from India and currently working at National University of Singapore as a uh, research associate. I, re- I initially joined NUS, National University of Singapore, as a PhD student to work on passive immunotherapy against influenza virus. And yes, I love the plaque assay. <laughs> Everything did not go well there, and I had to change my project and take up a job as RA, and I'm now pursuing my PhD part-time on animal models of urology related to bacterial infections. I must admit... TWIV has kept me hooked on virology, all the more uh, reason for me to listen to you all. So many thanks to you all again. I am not sure if you have spoken on, if you all have spoken on TWIV before. May I ask, what is your opinion on the debate of predatory journals and the Beals list being taken down? Here is a recent Nature News item on the topic, and he gives a link. Warm regards, Keter. P.S. It is hot and very humid in Singapore, <laughs> as I type, and I am sure it will be the same whenever you all read this. <laughs> it's, it never changes. It's just the same all the time. So, um, first of all, I, I find myself interested in uh, his uh, saying that, is it a he or a she? I'm not even sure of that. Uh, saying that uh, he's... Uh, timid about writing in. I can uh, remember the first few times I made phone calls to scientists and that kind of stuff, being very nervous uh, about the whole thing. And you just got to, uh, thanks for writing. According glad to that you, I'm glad that you uh, got up the courage and went ahead and did it. Supposedly, it's good to hear. Rich, supposedly it's a boy's name. Okay, I was just about to look that up. Thank you. Um, and uh, oh, yeah, the Beals list being taken. Well, what's our opinion on predatory journals? We've talked about this before. Yeah. It's a a problem. Though, yes. you know, I mean, how much of a problem is it, Alan? If, you, if you're, uh, if, it seems to me that if you're savvy at all, you just avoid them, okay? You, well, you throw away all, and you throw away all the emails. Okay, okay? that's, that's fine if... You recognize the what's going on, and you and you get rid of the email, and that doesn't apply to you. That's that's fine. But think about this: there are researchers out there who are 
doing something science-like in a lab and they aren't doing a very good job of it, but they would like to be able to publish it anyway. And they're getting pressure to publish so that they can advance their career. So they go to one of these predatory journals and publish their research in that. And now there's some unreviewed, basically unreviewed science that is part of the scientific literature. It's indexed in PubMed. It's out there. Um, there are a bunch of ways in which this can go horribly wrong from there. First of all, um, this has actually been done by anti-vaccine folks where they'll slip stuff into these predatory journals to get it indexed in PubMed and then write a review article in a not particularly good but uh, not completely scammy journal that references these predatory articles that they've submitted into the other journals. And now you've got a review making anti-vaccine arguments in literature and citing references. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. This That's starts to become a problem because people don't check references. So this is now starting to sound credible. Um, so it's a way to steal in. It's a way to steal credibility. It's also um, it's exploiting people who may not understand the the fake journal, or not fake journal, but the predatory journal scam and and what it entails. Um, that's especially a problem for people whose first language is not English, which is a what huge proportion. <laughs> what does it take to get your journal uh, listed on PubMed? Not much. Um, you, it does I, take time, though. <laughs> it does take time. But if you're one of these uh, one of these predatory journal mills, and there are a few that are that publish dozens or possibly even hundreds of of these journals then they've got the process down and that's what they do. And they put these things up and they pick names out of a hat to be their editorial board, even though they've never even talked to these people. Um, and presto, you've got a journal and you can charge people page fees and get their stuff, you know, there and indexed. And some of that science might be good. Some of it is a lot of it is not. We don't know because it's not been peer reviewed and nobody reads these things anyway. They're just there for the citations. Um, and that throws a wrench in all kinds of things that we do with it. Now, I'm not saying it's appropriate that we do this with the scientific literature, but people are scored for things like tenure review based on publication records. And somebody who's got a lot of publications, depending on the institution they're at, um, they may just look as far as something like an age index. So this all becomes this all becomes a big mess and probably the worst part about it for the open access folks is that this becomes a big black mark on open access because all these predatory journals the nature of the scam is that you charge page fees and you you say you're an open access journal and they are um but then people look at that and they say oh that's what open access is mm, right and of course, that's not what um, the people who pioneered open access <laughs> intended. It's not what PLOS is. Um, but at the same time, you have stuff like PLOS One that's not a predatory journal, but you have to get fairly finely into the nuances to explain how it differs. Right. So they do they do have peer review, but they've lowered the bar on peer review so that it doesn't have to be especially significant. It just has to be valid. And by doing that, they have made the business go into the black because they can publish um, orders of magnitude more papers, which is pretty much the same model the predatory journals are doing. The main difference is that PLOS One is doing it with good intentions. Mm. Right. So, yep. so this, this becomes, this becomes a real mess and it has become a real mess. And you have the, the poor schmucks who've been, who've had their names pulled out of a hat and put on the uh, editorial boards for these things. And, you know, Hey, what are you doing on the editorial board for a scam journal of, of, um, molecular virology and, um, 
Yeah, well, I, I didn't put myself on there. Uh, so it's it's a whole big thing. But there's nothing we can do about it. There is not much we can do about it. The Beals list was an attempt to catalog these and alert journal, alert mm-hmm. uh, libraries in particular that um, these are, you know, these are not the real deal. But that's not online anymore, and it's not clear that that was really an ultimate solution to the problem anyway. Yeah. So, Dixon. Every, every successful system attracts parasites. That's what I was just going to say. Got successful it. systems attract so parasites. So, are there no, um, uh, this article on, that he links here is interesting, and the article linked within that on uh, Beale's list being taken down is interesting. This guy Beale, Jeffrey Beale, was a librarian at the University of Colorado at Denver who single-handedly maintained uh, a list of predatory journals but uh, and it was taken down for no uh, published reasons though um, this talks about um, criticism that he faced of one sort or another uh, for the list you can imagine that um, yes you could uh, uh, be subject to all sorts of criticism and uh, maintaining something like that at any rate is there no other resource i recall looking at something recently when i was uh actually investigating a an apparently predatory journal myself but is there no, nothing like beale's list around a few people have tried to do stuff like that it's a heck of a lot of work yeah because these things pop up like mushrooms they just constantly and and i get emails i mean i i get emails and saying that uh uh, we were we were fascinated by your recent research published in, and they'll insert a title of an article that I <laughs> wrote recently. It's like that wasn't research; that was journalism. I, I, I get, I yeah, I get two or three emails a day. Yeah, that's very typical for you get anybody any in sticks? science. I have a few. They've asked me to serve on their editorial boards, and I've turned them all down. So, Dixon, um, can you take the next one? It's in sure. up your alley from Chaim. Chaim writes. We took a bike tour of Milan last week, and by the way, I saw the same building. And when we, and when I saw this new condo building called Bosco Verticale, I thought of Professor de Pommier. The tour guide tried to shock us by explaining that the units run around 1.1 million for a thousand square feet. But after a decade in New York and D.C., that seemed pretty reasonable to me. <laughs> this is not really a vertical farm, right? No, it's not a vertical farm. It's a uh, vertical it's forest, a decorated right? building. It's an apartment house, and I've seen the same building when I was in Milan recently. I believe it's designed by Ken Young, who, by the way, works out of Singapore, and uh, designs buildings that look like forests. Bosco meets pretty cool uh, forest, Yeah, it's, it's right? beautiful. It's actually quite stunning. Bosco is forest in uh, Italian, right? I don't know Italian, but you do. I believe it's Bosco is forest, vertical nice. forest. The vertical forest. Next one's from Edward. Hello, glorious Twiverati. My name is Ed Grow. Speaking of vertical forests, Ed Grow. <laughs> That's right. A postdoc studying fertility and embryogenesis at the University of Utah. Ed Appropriate Bro- topics for Dr. Grow. I Dr. Tell you. Grow, um, <coughs> I follow on Twitter, and he's very productive on Twitter. Good, mm-hmm. good person to follow. It's 75F24C in Salt Lake City and balmy, although we had snow last week, which melted in a day. Mm-hmm. I'm writing in regards to fabulous episode 441 in which you discuss the construction of consomic mice bearing different Y chromosomes on a black six, six background. At 3841, 38 minutes and 41 seconds, Rich mentions that during consomic generation, you get, quote, the whole Y chromosome of the mouse you started with. There's not an opportunity to get a hybrid Y chromosome, end quote, which is mostly true. But at this point, please have Kathy sing. But then- yeah. Okay. <laughs> the Y chromosome has a small portion called the pseudo autosomal region par, which is both homologous and orthologous to the par of the X chromosome. This region, while only five percent of the length of the Y chromosome, is responsible for pairing with the X and recombining with the X. Although small, the par is extremely important. In fact. This XY recombination at the par is required to avoid non-disjunction, which can lead to devastating sex chromosome aneuploides, often resulting in subfertility or infertility. Mm. Majority of the Y chromosome is referred to as the male-specific Y, MSY, 
and this region doesn't normally recombine with the X. Thus, the MSY should be inherited directly from father to son, while a par of the Y can recombine with the X. Put another way, the product of one normal male meiosis produces four haploid cells, each containing one sex chromosome, a non-recombinant X, a non-recombinant Y, a recombinant X, or a recombinant Y. In 50% of the male F1s, you should have a solely non-recombinant Y chromosome, which can likely be followed by marker analysis to ensure that the Y chromosome is in its, its entirety, both the PAR and the MSY is inherited. I started listening to TWIV 18 months ago and have progressed retrograde through <laughs> TWIV, TWIVO, TWIM, and TWIP. I've tr I'm trained in the endogenous retrovirus field, but I've learned so much from you and cannot imagine life without your podcast empire. There's no way to thank you as much as you deserve unless I win the lottery. <laughs> so I'll leave it at that. I think we did one of Ed's papers a long time ago on endogenous retroviruses, in fact. P.S. If I may have a listener pick of the week, I think I'll read it now. I feel like I'm cheating on my one true love to suggest another podcast. Well, I, maybe I won't. <laughs> but I recently ran across the BBC's In Our Time podcast of science history, the episode Lysenkoism detailing the scientific fraud of disgraced agriculturalist Trofim Lysenko, which led to the death of millions of Soviets, is a prescient reminder of the consequences when the state corrupts the scientific endeavor for political purposes. Sad, <laughs> to paraphrase someone else on Twitter. Yes. Sad. You know what that's about, Dixon? I, Sad. I'm not going to say it because against people will, democracy. No, people will no. say I'm too political. Uh, Daniel. No, who's D? Dixon already went, so Alan is <laughs> Daniel. <laughs> Wait, after Vincent is Kathy. That's right, Kay. You got it. Go ahead, Kathy. <laughs> Hannah writes, Hello, TWIV friends. I just wanted to write a quick note on something Kathy alluded to in TWIV 442, about 78 minutes in. She was talking about a graph noting the difference in agreement between liberals and conservatives when science is presented as intelligence versus curiosity. <laughs> between my work life and my personal life, I interact regularly with people from both political parties. I have found that the most effective way to talk to anyone about science is to remove the politics from it. I know you point out on TWIV that science is inherently a political issue, but if you present it as such, people will make assumptions based on their own views and subsequently tune out anything you have to say that doesn't match those views. However, if you talk about science with all of the passion you feel for it, people tend to listen because they want to understand your excitement. Then the conversation that could have gone, climate change is real because this researchers published a paper on it and ended in a fight, becomes, hey, I read this really interesting article paper the other day where X project had Y result. Isn't it odd that so much changed in a, sh changed in a short time? <laughs> and that ends in a discussion. This now taps into the scientific curiosity in the graph that Kathy mentioned. Keep up the excitement about science. Hannah, P.S. I'm in Boulder, Colorado, where we finally have a couple of days without thunderstorms, and it's currently sunny and 23C. Knowing the springtime weather in Colorado, I'm sure the storms will be back tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> I, All right. I, I, think, I think that's correct. We try not to make it too political, although it has crept up in the past. If you notice, we have not talked about the politics of science in a while, probably since the science march, right? But I agree that you... You politicize you, you polarize people, and you should just be excited about science, and that's what we do on TWIV, right? For the most part. Indeed. I'm looking at you, Dixon. I know you are, because I'm next. All right, go ahead. Anthony writes, <clears throat> I've not read the complete article, but I hope that feasibility is what's really meant and not possibility. F-W-I-W. <laughs> you know what that means? I know, no clue. You have no For clue? What it's worth. Really, Dixon? I don't. I don't talk in it's abbreviations. I Dick, talk Dixon, in complete spent sentences, and I use words that everybody can understand, not just a for, few for insiders. What it's, worth. it's an old for what one. it's worth. It's from your era, Dixon. I'm sorry, I don't use stuff like that. That doesn't resonate with me at all. You know, Dixon, not even a little bit. It'd be nice. In fact, sent, I get annoyed with this stuff. <laughs> You're ridiculous. When people <laughs> sent telegrams, they used to abbreviate things, just the same sorts of things. Well, it's fallen out of favor with certain groups, and this I'm is, in that Dixon, group. this is a paper describing the excision of proviruses, HIV, uh -huh. uh, by uh, you know, CRISPR, CRISPR-Cas9 right. CRISPR right. in an animal model. Hmm. 
So uh, they delivered the uh, the CRISPR, the, the guide RNAs by adeno-associated viruses, hmm. and um, these were um, so, so the the um, the way they did it was they had stem cells from HIV transgenic mice, and so they excised them and uh, they infected with adeno-associated viruses, and they showed they could excise the provirus. So, yes, so this is obviously something that people are interested in. The problem is, unless you get every provirus excised, there will always be some left, and that's the problem. So you got, you, I don't know that this is going to get every single one. I mean, we, we have lots of uh, hematopoietic progenitors in the bone marrow that are lately infected with HIV. I don't think you can get the provirus out of each one. That's a problem. But CRISPR-Cas9 will definitely allow you to excise it. Uh, Whether you can do it in all the cells is really the issue. So, you know, this this article doesn't address it, but eventually people will figure it out. All right, Dixon, was that that good? Yes. Alan is next. Yes. Alex writes, Cher Trivus et Trivus. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, that's good. I am an avid listener and new PI at the NIH and wanted to share with you a recent paper of ours published in the EMBO journal, which was conducted during my postdoctoral fellowship at the Institut Pasteur in France. I'm a co-first author. I think you'll find it interesting considering this. Okay, so this is somebody with an asterisk. Uh, I think you'll find it interesting considering the coverage you've dedicated to Zika virus. In this paper, we reveal a Zika virus-induced cytopathic effect in human cell lines and primary cells that is non-canonical and visually striking. Using time-lapse video microscopy, we followed the fate of Zika virus-infected cells to show that viral translocation into the endoplasmic reticulum causes massive vacuolization and an implosive cell death. It sounds very unpleasant for the cell. It does. This phenotype became apparent when we silenced an important player in the cell intrinsic innate immune response, IFITM3, deciphering the... And that's a molecule name. It's not an abbreviation, Dixon. Got it. Got it. Got it. Uh, Deciphering the (laughs) cellular signaling events that led to this bizarre type of cell death shows shows, uh, showed a crucial involvement of PI3 kinase activity that indicated that what we were observing is paraptosis, a poorly understood cell pathway that has never been associated with a human virus infection. These results may be crucial in our understanding of how infected cells such as neurons die in infected individuals. Furthermore, the role of the innate immune response in blocking these destructive events may explain why the majority of Zika virus infections are resolved by the host without major complications. Hmm. Attached to a PDF and a link URL link where you can find our movies. All right. So my only comment here is that this is done in HeLa cells, and I would love to see it in the actual target cells of Zika virus infection, right? And like, then uh, astrocytes, etc. Astrocytes, neurons, whatever. Yes, glia. That's it. By the way, Alan. Rich Conde. Just yes. for your information, IFITM3, I believe, is an abbreviation. It is. You're right. Yes, but I don't know it what is. it stands for. It is. It's, an, it's, it's a molecular <laughs> name. It's not a conversational abbreviation. Oh no, no, no. It's interferon-induced transmembrane protein. There you go. Uh, Rich Condit. Dennis writes. Hi, Docs. In TWIV 438, you had a wonderful discussion about teaching and explaining science. Dixon brought up the Mr. Wizard Show as a fine vehicle for teaching. I'd like to point folks to Reddit.com as an increasingly powerful communication tool for science. Reddit.com is now the sixth most visited site on the Internet. There are many subreddits where science teaching and learning are happening. Just as one example of a site where science is often learned, there's a page called Explain It Like I'm Five Years Old. (laughs) It's amazing how often an interesting question is asked and how often there are gold-winning answers where someone donated $3 to Reddit in the name of the answerer. There are many other subreddits such as Ask Physics, Space, SpaceX, (coughs) Chemistry, and Microbiology where questions can be asked and answered. Although there are often subthreads that are mainly punny or which reference something cultural or comic, there is a huge amount of learning going on. Scientists, for example, are holding Ask Me Anything sessions in uh, r slash IAMA 
or within other subredited uh, subredited wherein they can answer many good questions at uh, one sitting. Those are subreddits. Sorry. Mm. As a surprising uh, learning example, in ten seconds I learned how to unimpact an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> when I went to Reddit to check the names of some of the subreddits, the first video on the front page, thousands of people upvoted this, was of a park worker literally pulling on a rope of chewed grass, uh, pulling a rope of chewed grass out of an elephant's back end. <laughs> the rope was at least 10 feet long. Within 10 seconds, one, one learned that elephants can't get impacted. Can get, it. Can, can, can get impacted, educated people can help them out, and that the person doing it was not freaked out by the knowledge of from which end it was coming. <laughs> there are much more technical and learned subjects being discussed, for example, of complex chemical reactions and even links to new tools for writing and displaying them. That's, uh, it's my hope that indeed all generations are getting exposed to more and more bits, bytes, and gigabytes of science. Thanks, Dennis. Well, uh, there, I have to, there is our t- show title, Unimpacting an Elephant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. Pull on this rope. <laughs> There's hope. Uh, I have to say that uh, I am unfamiliar with Reddit. Oh, my gosh. You should Can go you? there. You got to need to go, and you will just waste hours and hours of your life. Uh, I had, uh, it what's is its a, niche relative to other sites? Oh, it's just a list of stuff, and people go and they post and they respond. Front page of the internet. The internet. It's just, um, okay. yeah, people people who uh, want to moderate a, a thread on it, um, it's got a hierarchical structure. So if you go to the front page of it, you can drill down into the different topics and, and directories within it. Um, and people will, uh, will run what's called a subreddit, which is a, a thread within a particular thing. Um, so like a yeah, tangent or a bifurcated thread or something, yes, I guess. Yes. So but it's it, kind of, yeah. it, it's <laughs> kind of, it's kind of like a giant discussion forum. It basically is. And there's good stuff and bad stuff, nice yes. stuff and nasty stuff. And there's ask me any things that many people can do. A lot of scientists, my son has been telling me to do one for years. You'll get lots more subscribers to your podcast. He tells me, so, you know, Obama didn't ask me anything. You basically go there and people ask you questions and you can pick which ones to answer and so forth. So it's, uh, my kids are on it all the time. Wow. How about that. Yeah. Rich, I've never been there either. Neither have I. But that, Thank you, Kathy. Thank <laughs> if you, I had Justin. said that, everybody would have laughed. So I waited till last before I said that. I'm going to laugh at Rich. How's that? No, me. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that's okay. I just, uh, you know, yeah. uh, I don't understand. You know, I don't have time to do what I'm doing. And I'm doing less and less. And, I, and I'm doing less and less social media. I, it's incredible how much time gets sucked up in this. Oh, yeah. At any rate, there you that's go. True. And hopefully, as Dennis describes, uh, people are uh, uh, people can use it to get um, useful information. Yes. Hmm. Science, science communication, like how to unimpact an elephant. <laughs> Next one's from May. We're, Hello, Vincent and the Twiv Masters. I'm a faithful Twiv listener. Love the show. Listen to all the episodes. I saw this cool paper in Science Magazine from the Feng Zhang Lab at MIT. You guys should talk about it on the show. Weather here is cloudy and windy. 22C, more rain to come. Take care, May in Rockville, Maryland. She sends paper in science called Nucleic Acid Detection with CRISPR-Cas13A slash C2C2. This is pretty cool, actually. Um, C2D, C2C2 was a prototype for R2D2. <laughs> the RNA-guided RNA targeting CRISPR effector Cas13A, previously known as C2C2, see, they changed its name, exhibits a collateral effect of promiscuous RNA activity upon target recognition. So they use that to make a diagnostic test. Maybe we'll do this sometime. This sounds cool. Mm. Very cool. Okay? Mm. Keep that in your heads. Mm. Kathy. Cool. Pete writes, Hello, doctors. Always risky to email while listening to an episode, but I don't want to forget this question. If it were feasible to remove, say, 1% to 5% of the irv base pairs from a sexually reproducing organism, one, would you expect that organism to be able to reproduce with an unmodified partner? Two, 
is blank. No, that's right. There is no two. <laughs> Three. Okay, now back to the real two. <laughs> what would be the effect on the organism? Like, would replication be more efficient or less error prone? I think number Three. two was missing because the previous message disimpacted it. <laughs> <laughs> or they right. eliminated it by cats. Right. <laughs> and three, is anyone attempting the experiment? The discussion reminded me of Greg Bear's novel, Darwin's Radio. I think herbs, herman, human endogenous retroviruses, could be the basis of many novels, hopefully including some more technically accurate than Bear's 1999 work. I listen to every episode of TWIV, TWIP, and TWIM. I'm not a scientist. I'm an engineer. But I love the shows. Be nice to Dixon, but not too nice. We don't want him to think you don't care. Smiley face. Aloha, Pete. <laughs> I love that. Okay. I'm not a scientist. Yeah. I'm an engineer. I love That's it. That's right. But, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So back to the questions. If you could remove 1% to 5% of the endogenous <coughs> retrovirus base pairs from a sexually reproducing organism, would you expect the organism to be able to reproduce with an unmodified partner? I see why not. Yeah. I think that'd be fine. It'd be like just having any any kind of a deletion. Yeah. Mm. If, yeah. It's, if it's viable. Right. Oh, yeah, of course. Well, it, we're talking about them reproducing, so exactly. they got to be viable yeah. in order I to mean, be, if, do it, that. I mean, if you took this 1% to 5% out of the Y chromosome or the X chromosome, maybe that would be a problem, right? Mm. But, but it's not a lot, considering, you know, 40%. Well, IRVs are, are 11% of our genome, half of it. I don't think it should be a problem. But Ed Grow, if you're listening, would that be a problem? He does, hey. he does listen. He does. Okay. And then back to the same question. If you removed 1% to 5% of the irv base pairs, what would be the effect on the organism? Would replication be more efficient? I don't think it would matter too much, and, and it wouldn't affect the error uh, rate of the polymerase. But, no. you know, endogenous retroviruses do have functions in the genome, some of which we've talked about. Um, one of them is to provide... Um, promoters for interferon genes. The syncytion gene was de derived from an IRV. Some of the RNAs that are made are important for uh, pluripotency of stem cells. So, you know, if you took those out, you would mm. have a problem. And you right. might have and problems think, that, are not, that are not immediately apparent. Yep. yep. I right. think that that's, uh, that's, among other things, what this is uh, referring to, and particularly the the pluripotency of stem cells. How did that go? There's a lot of herb transcription activity. Yeah. Yep, early on. Um, yeah. uh, uh, early on. Yeah, if you and, take it uh, away, you lose pluripotency, right? Or maybe the opposite, one of those two. And I think that was Ed Groh's work, <laughs> in fact. So, Ed, you could you could set us straight. And I think that there are a, a number of labs that are tinkering with, uh, uh, I can't say chapter and verse, but... Uh, um, methods for removing retroviruses. We just did a paper for removing HIV, yeah. uh, but you know to to discover um, what these things are for. Methods to re remove as many of them as possible. Well, you remember we mentioned recently from George Church's lab. There you go. He removed all the pervs from a cell line. Here's the paper, Science 2015, Genome-Wide Inactivation of Porcine Endogenous Retroviruses for Transplantation. So they did it in a cell line, and they took out 62 <laughs> endogenous, porcine endogenous retroviruses. So for transplantation, they have to make pigs lacking right. these. So I guess they're working on it. So for transplantation, yeah, this is an issue. For, I don't know why else it would be an issue to remove herbs, but definitely for organ transplants. So, so yes, people are attempting the experiment essentially, yeah. not not just to remove the herbs, but they're attempting it for the purpose of transplanting. Right. And we don't know what effects there might be on the organism. We do. Uh, but given that uh, herbs have, uh, there's indications that herbs have uh, potential functions. Uh, it might be there might be an effect. Just yeah. So the it. the upside is that you get a new liver. Um, the downside is that you can no longer distinguish Mozart from Wagner. Correct. Or single malt from Cuttiesark. Uh In churches, uh, in churches paper, they successfully do that and get viable cells out yeah. the other end. Cells are. Fine. They just did it in cell culture, right? Right. They unimpacted the cells. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bill writes. 
Dear TWIV team, having listened to TWIV for a number of years now, I have absorbed a lot of horology in a scattershot manner. I finally decided to go hunt down the Virology 101 sessions on your webpage and have found them fascinating. They are called out in the webpage, but I ended up downloading them as MP3s, which means my iPhone music app or presented them. It is not clear how to download them as simple sequential podcasts. The music app works okay for songs, but a virology lecture isn't a song. I want to be able to skip around easily, resume where I left off, and certainly I don't want them shuffled. I suggest that you duplicate the Virology 101 portions of previous TWIVs into a separate podcast stream. I don't imagine that this would be uh, much work, and it would be much easier than collecting various shows. You might even find a, a new sponsor who would be interested in this sub-series as a, with a longer shelf life and a stream of voices, of um, a stream of novices, sorry. It would be easier to update uh, dated lectures if needed. In the meantime, be nice to Dixon, the parasitologist formerly known as Dick. He reminds me of a favorite uncle who always has got your nose and is pulling quarters out of your ear. <laughs> you remember that, getting your <laughs> of nose? Of course, of course, mm-hmm. of course. <laughs> who is Bill Dixon? Who is Bill He's the science guy on a farm in Flemington, New Jersey. That's who he is. Yeah. But he's not the, the science guy. That's Bill. Dixon, you notice how many people talk about you in these letters? I do. I do you do. understand I... the power of podcasts now? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I know I have a lot of friends out there. That's for sure. They're all watching my back. They've I got my back. I suppose Bill is writing about the, the Virology 101s that we used to do and stuff. Yes, and we haven't, we yeah. haven't continued all right, so the first the question space, is, now. before addressing Bill's should we continue them? I think we should. Yeah. We didn't take it to the complete uh, viral no, I'm, factory. I'm looking at the list here. There are 11 of them. Starting we, with, we have uh, more Twiv, Starting with TWIV 39. Yeah, we should do uh, that. And we kind of went in and out of this. The last one was in uh, TWIV 238, and we'd gotten up to protein synthesis, lost in translation. Exactly. And then we stopped. That was in 2013. Yeah, we should resume. I could put them all in a separate we should resume. feed as well. But, Bill, I would suggest you get a different podcast player other than uh, iTunes or, MP3 and, or the iPhone phone music app. You should be playing your podcast actually on Podcasts, which is an Apple podcast app, or some other podcast app, and that will give you more flexibility about making collections and so mm-hmm. forth. Mm-hmm. Apple's new podcast specs are going to allow you to make seasons of podcasts, so we could put our Virology 101 into a season or something wow. like that. So stay tuned, Bill. I think these are good ideas. Yeah. Alan, you're next. Justin writes, Dear TWIV hosts, I'm a postdoc at Texas A&M University in the Center for Phage Technology. <laughs> Great name. <laughs> That's cool. I'm a longtime listener and avid fan of the show. Recently, people have complained about political topics being discussed on the podcast too often. I wanted to offer my humble opinion on the matter. I like hearing these issues discussed, and I feel like I benefit from your perspectives. I don't think I'm alone in my opinion either. This stuff is important and needs to be talked about. I do understand the counter-argument, though. Sometimes it's nice to stop thinking about politics and all the ugly things in the news and just think about something pure and beautiful, like capsid (laughs) structures, nucleic acid replication, viral evolution, and so on. This is just an idea, but I think it would be really cool if you could do more episodes centered specifically on science policy. Hmm. That way you could talk about policy issues without feeling encumbered, and the people who find that stuff boring could just skip those episodes entirely. I would love to hear people from the Twix gang chat with people from the Department of Agriculture, EPA, FDA, State Department, or maybe even a congressman on the Committee for Sci- on Science, Sm- Space, and Technology. If any of you know a good science policy podcast or any other reliable source of information on the subject already in existence, let me know. The topic of what other podcasts your listeners listen to has come up a few times. I listen to Hardcore History, Our Fake History, History on Fire, Mundo de los Microbios, a podcast about microbes in Spanish, Common Sense, Philosophy Bites, The Eastern Border, Inward Empire, all the Twix podcasts, and Urban Agriculture. That's quite a list. Mm-hmm. I'm running a few episodes behind at the moment, but if there happens to be a book contest, I'd like to be included in the email <laughs> count. Good strategy. Yeah. The weather is quite nice in College Station, at least for the time being. We're at a sunny 30 degrees C with a light breeze. <laughs> I have a few policy people I want to get on. Mary Woolley from Research America is really yeah. good. And I we tried to get Rush Holt for the science uh, right. twiv. 
and maybe we can get him back on. It'd be great to get some of the former heads of all those agencies he's mentioned also. Yes. You, uh, I'm pretty sure you won't be able to get anybody who's currently at any of those agencies because they've all been gagged. How that's about right. the f- former physicist who was the at the Department of Energy head or something? Oh, Stephen, yes. Stephen uh, no. Stephen Chen, is Chen. that his name? Yeah. Chow? Chen? Chu. Uh, Chu? Stephen Chu. Chu. Stephen Chu. Yeah, people like that, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, but he, he actually mustered out before the change of administration, though. He did. Yeah. He did. Um, I think he had let's, enough. Uh, Rich, let's do the last one here. Rich. Amanda writes, greetings to all. I am a long... <laughs> That's a good one. I have like a long it. time. That's uh, for the listeners out there. That's T W apostrophe A L L. That's very good. That's one the, the twin version of y'all. <laughs> I'm a long time listener of the Twix series and sometimes writer and a sometimes writer. I'm currently doing a clinical microbiology fellowship in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada, oh. where it is a dreary and uh, where it is dreary and nine degrees Celsius. Previously, I did a two-year stint in Garuka, Papua New Guinea, as head of virology at their Institute of Medical Research, which brings me to why I'm writing. I did a lot of, I did a lot of teaching staff there, mm-hmm. with the teaching staff or stuff. I don't, I don't understand. Yeah, I did a lot, I did a lot of teaching stuff there, yeah. with not a lot of resources. When Dixon et al. released. The sixth edition of Parasitic Diseases for free, I was able to download the PDF and send to my colleagues by USB, so thank you for that. While there, I wanted to share your Coursera virology course with my staff, as they do not have a specialized vir- special, any specialized virology courses there. But the best internet connection in Goroka is a shoddy 2G and quite expensive. Mm-hmm. If I can get an appropriately sized USB to you, would you be willing to load the lectures onto it for me so that I can send to my PNG friends? I know a lot of people say they fall asleep to TWIB, but I'm the opposite. <laughs> I use TWIB. <laughs> I use Twitter to stay awake in my morning commute. As always, thanks for all you do for science communication and education. Oh, nice. Amanda Lang. Wow. She's Amanda. at the she's at Amanda. She's a clinical microbiology fellow at Nova Scotia Health Authority. Also director of virology at the Saskatchewan Disease Control Laboratory, Saskatchewan, I can I say I wonder it. if she would <laughs> be willing to serve as a substitute host sometime on our show. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's far away. So, that's quite a commute, so, though, from Nova Scotia to Nova Saskatchewan. Scotia, Saskatchewan. <laughs> it's a very, very long commute indeed. Um, wow. So I, I will definitely... I'm having Let's USB out. USB drives made with a Microbe TV logo that's on them. And I'm going to send them to people who would like the lectures for, like, Amanda can't download wow, look them. At you, so look at you. We're doing that. That's great. That's another way that your Microbe TV donations is being used. All right, let's do some picks of the week. Is that a good idea, folks? It's a wonderful sure. idea. It's a fabulous. Alan Dove, what do you have today? Yes. I have something that came up on a photo blog that I read. Um, this is a, it's a photographer's report of his experience photographing um, hunters, essentially, in Siberia who are hunting mammoths. <laughs> And they are specifically going and digging up through the permafrost, uh, through uh, hills, through hillsides in Siberia, to try and find mammoth tusks. Hmm. Now, hmm. this is not just for curiosity. It turns out that there's a market for these. You can you can sell them. They're ivory, but they are um, fossilized ivory. Uh, well, or actually not fossilized. It's not fully mineralized, but they're distinguishable from elephant ivory. So they're actually legal to trade internationally. And apparently one mammoth tusk can bring like $34,000 in income, which is a big deal in an area where the average salary is $500 a month. So the, this guy meets someone who's involved in this as part of another project and goes into this remote section of Siberia with these guys who are actually doing this kind of illegitimately. They don't have a permit or anything to do it, but they, they pump water into the hillside and they Mm. dig up these, um, uh, you know, it shows 
the fire hose that they're spraying into this muddy hillside and they're um, pulling out all these prehistoric animal bones and um, they actually recovered some mammoth tusks so it was successful but it's just it, it was a real eye-opener to me i mean here are these people who are totally off the books you know they're they're doing this there's no it's not legal for them to do this so of course it's kind of hush hush but they're doing this major mining operation that's digging into permafrost containing these specimens um and there's this whole trade going on and to some extent, you know, this is interesting as a as a microbiologist because this is the kind of place where you get emerging infections coming from. Mm-hmm. Um, and and there's also, you know, just the whole sociological aspect of it that this is something that people are um, are compelled to do in the modern world. I like this photo of the guy's feet covered with mosquitoes. Uh, yes. I have to yeah. say, looking <laughs> looking through this, this looks just awful. Brutal. Doing this, it's it, 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 um, the economics uh, must really be something because you yeah. think that there must be an easier way to make that kind of money because this looks really, really awful. If you want to it's get a, really it's a grossed huge out, huge project, Rich. If you want to get really grossed out, go to the uh, South American gold mines. South American gold oh, mines. What, what do they do there? They just dig up a portion of the jungle and just drain the whole thing. They just yeah. they're just awful. It's it's just, yeah. Environmental destruction. Yeah. And and these guys, I mean, they're oh. they're hosing into the permafrost and digging right. through the mud That's in right. what's That's gotta right. be these cold, horrid conditions and awful swamped conditions. by mosquitoes and um mm. hauling their gear through the area. It's yeah. it's yeah. it's just really interesting I found on a bunch of levels. Look at this prehistoric bison skull sitting here. Yes. Yeah, and that's just that's trash. I they mean, they're just it. pulling, they're pulling these bones and things out because they're after the mammoth tusks. Oh my gosh, wrecking the memori- earth. Here's a memorial to two tuskers who earned over a hundred thousand dollars, but ended up dead when they crashed their boat after drunken partying. Yes, so or got eaten by a polar bear. I mean, you can get. There's a lot of bears in those areas, also, by the way. Many Tuskers have little resources, like this young man who has converted the engine from a Soviet-era brand snowmobile into a water pump. <laughs> yes. My God. Yeah. Amazing, Alan. Mm. That's amazing. Yep. Rich, what do you have? Uh, this is uh, quite different. I was just <laughs> thinking about this. Just thinking about this the other day, and I wanted to bring it up for discussion. Occam's razor. Yeah. Because this is something I don't know if we've ever discussed this, and it's something I use. Uh, all the time, and looking it up myself, I'm not sure that I should use it as much as I should. Okay, <laughs> but um, it's something you often hear referred to in scientific uh, discussions. It's also known as the law of parsimony, which um, uh, goes that among competing hypotheses, the one with the fewest assumptions should be selected. Hmm. Named after a scholar and philosopher and theologian William of Aachen, who uh, was alive in the 13th and uh, 14th centuries. And so basically, uh, you know, I use this, um, I use this, uh, or did use it in scientific uh, discussions all the time. When we have uh, ideas about what the explanation for a, speci- uh, for a particular result was. And um, uh, quite often it came around to that explanation is much too complicated there are many two what ifs where well, the occam's razor says the simplest uh explanation is likely to be the right one but as i look at this there's no reason that that is necessarily true okay <laughs> it's an interesting heuristic guide as they say in the de- uh, development of models but it's not necessarily true. especially it's, it's an it intellectual can... shortcut yes yeah. you yeah. should you you can use this as a first approximation of of how to formulate a hypothesis. You should try to make it simple, but not go overboard by saying, "Well, this is a little more complex than that, so we'll we'll choose the simpler one." Uh, it's not a it's not a rule. I mean, if you look at what's going on now with cosmology and the hypotheses as to how many universes there are, it has gone from one universe to n universes that's the opposite of occam's razor i think and then and physicists hate that rule because 
a lot of the, um, the the stuff at the molecular at the submolecular level, uh, quantum level, doesn't fit into any of that stuff, right? I mean, they've, they've got very complicated explanations for things. So, I'm not sure if anyone's ever proven anything by saying, "Well, Occam's razor says," right. but it certainly simplifies the next step in the experiment because you can base it on something at least, rather than all these variables that you can't control. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. What have I got? We got. Yeah, well, I got some pretty pictures again. I, I'm a visual kind of guy, as everybody out there knows. And so what you're looking at here are up-close personal views of things, not all of which are menacing, but some of which are very menacing. Some uh, lice and some uh, other interesting minutia that when you look at them blown up <laughs> – they don't look like minutia anymore, isn't it's the uh, elegance of nature uh, at where, where, every level. Is there a link here I ought to be looking yes, at? Yes, it's, it's below mine. It's out of order. Yeah. I'm moving it. Okay. That's in Cosmos magazine. I've started to subscribe to wow. that. Wow. They're cool. they're fabulous. They are you know? beautiful. Amazing. I mean that, Cosmos I guess magazine, not to be confused with Cosmo. Uh, exactly right. Um <laughs> yeah. I think the reason why everybody's attracted to science in some way is because you've seen elegance and beauty in something and it attracted you to that and then you stuck with that and you continued to want to see more and more and more of that. So every one of us has a different take on that, but yet we all see elegance and beauty in nature. I was attracted to things I could not see. Well, yeah. but you now can see them though, can't you? These really are cool, Dixon. I'm I'm always amazed <laughs> at the 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 structural detail yeah, me too. and the minutia is just incredible. I mean, these, some of these things have circulatory systems and they have organs and all kinds of, they have a brain, uh, you know, to organize it at that small a level is quite, quite elegant for nature, I think. All right. <laughs> so I'm, I'm highly <laughs> cool. impressed. Very pretty. I'm glad you like them. Kathy, what do you have? I picked today's Google Doodle. So today is June 22nd. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. And it's uh, like this it. thing uh, where it's about Oscar Fischinger. Fischinger. Fischinger, yeah. Um, uh, and you can create your own visual musical composition. It's fun. You can change all these parameters of what fun. the instruments are like. Yeah. It, it just does a loop. And then you can change components of that. But I opened multiple windows. <laughs> so then I had multiple loops going. So in the same way that... Dixon is very visual uh, about photography. This, to me, was just the coolest thing to do in music. And um, let's see, where did I have my information about Oscar Fischer? Here it is. So he w lived from 1900 to 1967, a German-American abstract animator, filmmaker, and painter, noted for creating abstract musical animation many decades before the appearance of computer graphics and music videos. So that's just reading straight out of Wikipedia because I didn't know anything about him. And that's what's cool about Google Doodles is you often learn about right. people and things that you didn't know about. Yeah. So I hope the link is permanent. But if not, there I gave uh, Vincent, I gave you the link <laughs> to the <laughs> archive. So you should be able to. Kathy, find it. I wanted to know what my three initials sounded like. So I typed them out on the patterns that they give you 3Ds. Uh -huh. <laughs> it was cool. quite interesting, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's very neat. Uh, cool. My, my pick is a Washington Post article entitled EU Court Vaccines Can Be Blamed for Illnesses Without Proof. It was sent to me by my colleague Solomon Moshewitz, who did not send it as a pick, so I take it as a pick. <clears throat> Highest Court of the European Union ruled that courts can consider whether a vaccination led to someone developing an illness even when there is no scientific proof. It was uh, in relation oh. to a case of a Frenchman who got a Hep B vaccine in 98. Oh, a year later, he got multiple sclerosis. In 2006, he sued Sanofi, who made the vaccine, uh, to be compensated for the damage. France's Court of Appeal said there was no causal link between the vaccine and MS, so they dismissed the case. There's no relationship between the two in other studies. Uh, it went to the EU, who decided that... Um, a vaccine could be considered defective if there was specific and consistent evidence, uh, including the time between the administration and onset of disease. So Paul Offit said, <laughs> this is great. He says, 
Um, this could be, um, where is that damned quote that I just lost it? Uh, where is it? Uh, using up, those cri- using yeah. those criteria, you could reasonably make the case that someone should be compensated for developing leukemia after eating a peanut butter sandwich. Yes, basically yes. Uh, what they're saying here. So this is very frustrating, of course, because one wonders where the science is going in this world. But we will keep pushing it. I hope this doesn't come to the U.S. Mm. So we'll we'll certainly cover it. We had yes, anyone wanted to maybe see? I, England I'm, was smart in getting out. No, of the no, EU. no, they were not smart <laughs> in getting out of the EU. Um, I'm not entirely convinced that this is as bad as it's being made out to be. To that sounds to bad sound. to me. It sounds hey, horrible. Well, but they said, despite lack of scientific consensus on the issue, of vaccine could be considered effective if there was, quote, specific and consistent evidence. Yeah, including an association in including time. Including an association <laughs> reporting it. And, and a significant number of reported cases of the disease occurring following vaccination. So okay. they're using now, scientific methods. They're using the, the, yeah. They're using the standards that we would apply to a study <clears throat> that would try and find a causal relationship. Right. Right. So there's still a hurdle that has, I, I'm not thrilled with the idea that they are rejecting the scientific literature on this, but it does sound like there's language in there that's saying you have to show that there's a significant number of reported cases of this happening after vaccination and that there's um, specific and consistent evidence. Um, it's, it's weaker than it should be, but I don't think it's necessarily the end of um, of science on this. I think the gold standard here is the Guillain-Barre syndrome after the swine flu vaccinations yes. in the seventies, and I and I that's that's a good you know precedent to say if it doesn't meet these standards, then it's it's not valid to to call this. Right. By the way, they didn't rule on the Frenchman's case. I was going to ask. No, what they didn't say anything about. It. They just made this this. General general, statement. I'm not sure exactly how the jurisdiction works there. Um, The EU is not, they they don't trump national governments. So the national, the the government of France is still the government of France. Mm -hmm. So just because the EU court said um, that this is their standard doesn't mean that uh, France is... uh, has to be completely beholden to it. So I'm not entirely sure what the so if you had a, a court decision in France and then you would you appeal to the EU and if they ruled it's differently, not, it's not quite like the U.S. and the Supreme Court, where if the Supreme Court overturns a case, then the right. case is overturned. End right. of discussion. Right. Okay. Um, France can still have its own laws, and they have their own government, and they have their own court system, and um. What their what their court has ruled would be the ruling, and I I don't know. As I say, I'm not familiar enough with the EU system, but I do know that it's not it's not federalism, mm. not yet anyway. All right, uh, we had a listener pick by Ed Grow, which you'll remember. Um, we did, and we thank you yeah. for that. And that'll do it for Twiv four four seven. You can find it at Apple Podcasts, Microbe TV slash Twiv. If you like what we do, consider. Supporting us financially, go to microbe.tv slash contribute. We have several methods available, like Patreon. You could subscribe for a buck a month and other ways as well. We would love to have your support. And if you have questions and comments, send them to twiv at twiv, twiv at microbe.tv. Dixon de Palmier can be found at thelivingriver.org. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor at the University of Florida in Gainesville, currently residing in Austin, Texas, but today coming to you from Oregon. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. We had the uh, title for a while, itinerant virologist. So that's that's what I'm doing. (laughs) He's the itinerant virologist. Mm -hmm. Alan Dove is at alandove.com. He's also on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thanks. Always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Our next show will be from Madison, Wisconsin. In just a few days, we'll all be there. And you should come because we have quite a few T-shirts to throw out into the audience. We do. I don't see how far Dixon can throw one. 
can throw that one pretty far. I used to pitch for my college team and told the coach of the team got up and hit one out of the park. He says, you're an outfielder. <laughs> this is a hardball? Yeah, this oh, is hardball. It was definitely hardball. Introductory music by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. We've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.